Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 54 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. In today's episode, I speak with bassist Emilio Garino, who is the author of a new book for recent music graduates called Make It. We discuss the value of business skills for all musicians, how musicians can make the most out of their day jobs, when it's time to pull the plug on your day job and go full-time with music, and much, much more. One lucky listener will get a chance to win a signed copy of Emilio's new book, and all you have to do for a chance to win is subscribe to the Clarinet mailing list. You can do this at www.clarinet.com. Dot com and simply enter your email address in the link on the sidebar. If you don't want to wait, I actually would really highly recommend reading Emilio's book anyways. It's a short read. You can probably finish it in about uh, a day or two, um, but it starts at just $3 on Amazon. Now, if you've drank a cup of coffee today or a tea or anything like that, you probably paid more than $3. And this book honestly provided me with a ton of value. I really enjoyed reading it. It was just densely packed with fantastic bits of information. And uh, if you're a recent music grad, it's a no-brainer. Pick up this book. I've got links to it in the show notes for uh, the US, Canadian, and UK Amazon sites. And it can actually be purchased directly from Emilio's website as well. Before we get started with the episode this week, I would just like to mention two things. And the first one is, it actually has to do with the giveaways. Um, I've been having trouble reaching people who are winning giveaway prizes, and I have a feeling that the problem is actually that you need to add me to your contacts list because maybe the messages are going to the junk mail folder. So if you have subscribed or if you are thinking of subscribing today for a chance to win this book, please make sure to enter sean.perrin at clarinet.com. That's S-E-A-N dot P-E-R-R-I-N at clarinet.com to your contacts list. This way, if I contact you about, well, about anything really, about a coupon or upcoming episode or questions for a guest. But most importantly, um, if you've won a giveaway, this will make sure that that message actually reaches you. This is hugely important because if I do send out a message, I normally need to hear back within 40, 48 hours and then I have to move on to the next person. So if you are actively interested in Clarinet and you want a chance to win the giveaways, I highly, highly recommend that you add me to your contacts list. Also, by the way, if you do feel like you want to send me an email and let me know where you're from, what you're doing, which episodes you like, some questions for guests, anything like that, I'm more than happy to hear from you and I try to reply to all messages that I receive. The other thing I'd like to mention before we get started today is that we have uh, have two new Patreon backers, Garrett and Susan. Thank you so much to both of you for kicking in and helping the Clarinet podcast. Thanks to you, we've actually reached the first funding goal, which was $20 a month, and that helps cover the cost of Libsyn, which is the podcast hosting service. So listeners are now allowing other listeners to listen to the podcast. How cool is that? Um, We're actually now at $23, and the next funding goal is $50, and what that will enable is I will add a content distribution network to the podcast, which will speed up the website for worldwide users, and uh, that will also cover the monthly hosting charges on Media Temple, which is my website hosting company. So if you are interested in uh, either contributing directly to the podcast on Patreon, please see www.patreon.com slash Clarinet. Or if you're interested in learning about other ways you can help support the podcast, including doing your regular shopping on Amazon and uh, having a portion of it go towards the Clarinet podcast, see clarinet.com slash support. Of course, the Clarinet Podcast is also brought to you by our sponsor, D'Addario Woodwinds. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds. 
So I'm here today with Emilio Garino, who is the author of a new book called Make It, which is a guide for recent music graduates. He's also a bass player currently living in Jersey City, which for those who don't know, is right outside of New York City and, and kind of across the river from Manhattan. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today, Emilio. Yeah, it's good to be here. So would you start out, just for those who are unfamiliar with you, we're all clarinetists here, would you start out by sort of giving a Coles Notes version of who you are, what you do, and why you wrote this book? Basically, I'm a, a freelance musician at this point in my career. That's that's the, the best label you could put on me. I do some other things, too, on top of that. But, um, yeah, I live right across the water from New York, so I work in the city a lot. Um, then there's also a lot of gigs just around Jersey that I do. Um, I get to travel a little bit now. It's it's That's been, like pretty consistent. Um, so I'm, I'm just doing the music thing. Um, and like, like I joke about it. I'm like saying that I live, I'm living the dream, man. Um, <laughs> which is, which is, it's, it's pretty cool that I even get to do this. I'm, I'm very thankful. Um, but, uh, basically the idea behind the book, I didn't like wake up one day and decide like, Oh, I'm, I'm the, I'm the expert on this now. Like I'm the man you got to go to. But um, it, it came from like a lot of little taps on the shoulder from people basically. Um, cause I would go out and play and you just meet people and especially at colleges, um, when I would go and, and play for just, you know, different, different things. I work with a lot of people in a lot of groups. Um, but yeah, I would go and talk to students and I, I started to get messages from people who would see things I'm doing and, you know, they would just want advice on stuff like, Oh, how'd you get that gig? Or how did you get this started? Or, you know, what, what, what did you do when you first finished at art? Like what I, I went to graduate school at the art school, I should probably uh, clarify, but they said, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. What, 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 what were you doing when you first finished? Um, and I just kept getting enough of those questions. Uh, and I started to think, man, I guess I do know something about this if people keep asking. And what I decided to do was, let me think about this around, I guess it was around this time last year, as well as a little bit before I was traveling back and forth. Um, I was doing a project with the Lucerne festival in Switzerland. So I was going back and forth on all these long flights. Um, so I said, you know what, I'm going to just start writing this thing and see where it goes. Um, so before that I had like started to write a couple things. I had some notes, but I like started and gave up a couple times as many people do when they, they start to work on any kind of book. But um, yeah, so eventually being stuck in these long flights, I, I just started cranking away at it cause I had long, uh, uninterrupted periods of time. Um, and then enough started coming out and I started to organize it and I, I was like, okay, I think I, I think I have something here. Um, and I just tried to approach it from the viewpoint of like, what would I have wanted to know when like what, whatever it was like three, four years ago when I was coming out of grad school or even back in like 2010 when I was finishing my, my undergraduate degree, like what's all like the, the nuts and bolts I wish somebody just told me. And that's everything I tried to put into the book. Um, and it's, it's a lot of different things. Some of it is more concrete, like, like this is the tax form you need to deal with. And then some of it is more, um, more about just how you carry yourself. Like the, the, one of the earlier chapters is about mindset and just how to, how to think about things and not forget the big picture of the book or uh, of uh, your career, not the book. Um, so it's, it's just like, it's supposed to be a little, little package that you can just take with you. It's not a long read. I did that on purpose. I didn't want this big intimidating thing that felt like you had a million things to know. Um, and my goal with it was that if you buy this book, and, and, and you read it, I want you to be focused and I want you to take action. Um, so that's like one important thing that I, I folded into, I think pretty much every chapter is, um, I have a section called actionable steps where I, I just give you an example of one idea of something you could do to implement what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that that was a really important thing because I, it's really easy to, to read. And when you read a book about, some topic or for some problem that you're trying to solve, the act of reading sometimes makes you feel like you did something already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, definitely. But you know, and, and I'm totally guilty of this by the way, like I will <laughs> read and read and read and research and, and just collect all this information. And then the next thing, you know, I'm like, wait, I haven't actually like taken, I haven't executed anything. Nothing's happened yet. Yeah. Um, I've just been preparing to do that. Right. So 
I thought it was very important to to just give people something that they can use as a starting a starting point. Um, and th- there's just like a couple different projects. You know, some of it is like like for the mindset stuff. That's I feel like that's a little bit harder to teach. Um, but I, I tried to give some examples anyway, just as far as like building some kind of mental fortitude and, and toughness and like base like psychi- psychologists would call it like being gritty, right? Yeah. So when things aren't quite working, you hang in there and slug it out and, and you get it to happen anyway. You think that musicians would in some way be sort of used to already giving their all and, and experimenting and trying again, but they seem to be able to do it with everything except the actual business side of their music. Like they can push through a scale or a piece and work on the same yeah. etude for three months to get it perfect, but they won't call someone back about a gig. Like it's, why do you think there's this limitation in, in the musician's mindset? Is it personal embarrassment or some kind of... Uh, doubt or um i mean it's cer- like it's certainly possible that it it just comes down to you know like l- like a like an inner kind of self doubt where maybe you don't do things but i think a lot of the stuff that you need to do like if it come like if you want to book a gig and you're everybody's telling you no and and you just need to hang in there and get somebody to tell you yes and just it's kind of just math like you email enough places and eventually somebody will get yeah. back to you <laughs> and you're going to get, you're going to get so many no's just, you know, the probability of it. Right. Uh, but if you, you contact enough, then you'll get a yes, you know? So, um, I think a lot of those types of things are just, they're skills that you have to practice like any other skill. And I don't think musicians always look at them under that light. Like they look at their instrument as like, yeah, this is a skill that I have to practice totally. Um, but you know, they don't look at, making money or booking gigs or like responding to people on time as a skill or like staying organized with just how you run Mm -hmm. your whole operation. They don't, um, they don't, people don't always view that as a skill that you can work on and get better at and get more efficient at. But I think that all that stuff totally falls into that kind of categorization. Um, and I don't know what it's it. like in the States, but uh, up in Canada here, um, especially in high school, we don't learn anything in school about how to file a tax return, what the various terms on a mortgage document means. And and then in school, <laughs> in, in music, we don't learn about the business of music and, and what is polite as far as a, a term to con- uh, reply to a contractor or how to find a contractor or how to form a... a, a uh, an ensemble that's sort of framed around a tour or these kind of things. You never hear about any of this kind of stuff. You're just kind of thrown into it um, once you graduate. Yeah. And so I think that this book is really going to be helpful for so many people. And one of the most compelling parts about it right now, and I, I don't know if this is a short term thing, but at the time of this interview air, um, being recorded, it's only priced at $3 for the Kindle edition on Amazon. What was your thought behind that? That's a great price point. Okay. So um, this is something I learned through doing the book is like once you put your, once you like submit to amazon.com, you mm-hmm. can't change what the prices of anything are. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, so it's a mistake. It, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cause I tried to play around with it a little bit and then they were like, yeah, once it's in, like you can recommend what you think it should be sold at. But then I guess it's like one of these things where Amazon has robots around the web and if they see like, the, the book or a product being sold for a, lo- a lower price somewhere else, they like adjust it. And so it, like they have some kind of tech happening that I can't control or don't even completely understand. Um, but I, what I wanted as far as the pricing is I just wanted to give people a couple of options so that they can get it however they like. Um, mm-hmm. Like some people, like personally, I don't like doing the ebook thing that much, mm-hmm. which is like, kind of funny because I'm selling an ebook, right? But that's, that's just, that's just me. I like paperback books. Um, but not everybody's like me. A lot of people love the Kindle thing. Um, and they're really into the ebook thing and that's, and they don't have any paper books. So I I said, you know what, let me make sure that people can get it very inexpensively, at least somewhere. Yeah. So they have that. And then if they want a paperback book, you can get that. It's a little pricey right now. Like, like if you get the paperback through my website, it's cheaper Mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, Amazon hasn't caught up with me, but, (laughs) (laughs) um, but then, uh, all, you can also get the ebook on my website. It's more expensive there, but the difference is when I update this in the future, anything that you buy through my website, you just get that pushed to you for free. Mm -hmm. So 
it's whereas with the Amazon thing, you just, you buy it that one time and it is what it is. And you know, that's it. So I just, as far as the pricing, I tried to give people a couple different options. Um, there's an audio book on my website too. If you want to just listen to the whole thing. Or are you reading it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Uh, What was it like recording that? I've always wondered, um, what it'd be like to record an audio book. Is it frustrating? (laughs) Yeah. I was going to say though, if, um, for anyone who has plans to do a book or finds themselves working on one in the future, I think doing an audiobook is a great thing because I don't care how many times you proofread, how many rounds of editing you go through, you're, there's always going to be a couple bugs that are hard to just get out in the copy. So when you sit there and have to read through the entire book yourself, those last couple of typos that, that just found their way in somehow, you'll catch them because you're sitting there reading it out loud. Um, you know, also it's a little... It it probably took me like two and a half days to get it done. And listening to yourself talk for two and a half days is like, it's really weird. Um, Especially when you're, you're listening critically and like trying, I mean, I'm sure you get into this from doing a podcast, right? Well, yeah, right now I've got about 10 episodes to edit and uh, (laughs) it's going to be a bit of a drain on my ears personally, because you start to sort of lose track of hearing yourself. It's just kind of like this stuff that's... (laughs) It's, it's a different way of listening. Yeah. Yeah. It's can be very tiring to listen yeah, to that many words. Well, it's, it, I feel like it's, it's a little worse too with a book because like I, I, I had to take a lot of breaks just to get through it because it's that thing where sometimes, you know, when you like repeat a word so many times, it like stops making sense. Yes. Yes. There's actually a word for that, ironically. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah, I know what you mean. I'll, you can look at something and it's like, wait a second, is that spelled right? It's a word like, ah, uh, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you get a little loopy and then, um, like my throat started to, to bother me a little bit just from, oh really from talking that much. Yeah. Because when you're, when you're talking in conversation with somebody, you think about it, you take breaks and there's a, a cadence to, to things and you hear the other person start to speak. So you, you wait and, but with the book, you're, you're trying to read it in an organic kind of way. And it yeah. just like, it, it's, it, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to do <laughs> doing an audio book. It's work, you know, it's, it's very yeah. challenging. Well, I think it's a great accomplishment, especially we must be about the same age. Cause I graduated in 2009 from my undergrad. So you said you're oh, 20, okay. 2010. So about the same time. One of the things, let's, do, let's head back into the book here. We could talk about the technical aspects of it. Oh, sure. <laughs> probably yeah, all, yeah. Probably all day as well. That's just more probably my interest than anyone else's. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole podcast in itself. Yeah, right? this is us nerding out here on the behind the scenes. But I guess you're kind of an advocate, though, for other people to find value in this sort of entrepreneurial or different side of, of, of music, right? And, and um, one of the things you were mentioning at the beginning, which I really liked, was this whole concept of a rising tide raises all ships or something like that. Oh, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, Yeah. 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 Could you go into why you think that's important and and how by expanding your musical um, endeavors in this way, you can, you can do that. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I I feel that way. Cause I, I, my feeling coming out of school was that we were, taught like there was a couple classes that tried to get us to open up to other other things but generally the message is that they they sort of funnel you towards a a couple different career paths that we've all heard about you know so some people are encouraged to do like competitions and and distinguish themselves that way people are pushed towards the orchestra audition thing um which like the like even modern conservatories that's still how the curriculum is kind of set up is to to prepare people to play in an, or- in an orchestra. That's like all the ear training and the sight reading stuff and um, mm-hmm. like excerpt class and all that. That's, it's like, like it's gotten better um, and it, it depends. Some schools are better than others for sure, but that's still like the general shape of the curriculum, I feel. Um, and especially now there's just so many different ways to do it. There's so many, like people have so many different individual interests that, could be part of the music career in some way. Um, I think people need to be encouraged to explore those things more. Um, so like one thing that, that they did at the heart school, I studied with, uh, this guy, Robert Black, who he plays with the bang and a can all stars. I'm not sure if you're familiar oh, yes, with that. Absolutely. Yeah, I've had Evan Zipporin on here. He plays with them too. Oh, amazing. Okay. Right. So, um, Robert Black is the bass player in that group. 
and he's the person I studied with with uh, for graduate school. And one of the things he does at heart that I really think is um, is super cool and and very forward thinking is I had to do two recitals that were required by the school, right? And they were more of what you'd expect. I had a I did some standard repertoire. I played my concerto, did some Bach, and then I did a contemporary music recital. But then Robert requested that his graduate students also plan a third, he, he would use the word event, right? He didn't call mm-hmm. it, it could be a recital if that's what you wanted to do. But the way he explained it to me is he said, everyone who comes through always has some other part of their musical life that maybe doesn't fit the conservatory thing that cleanly. So there, and, and the events that people would do were, were kind of all over the place, which I think is a good thing. Like some people would just do basically like a third recital and, and that was that. Then some people would do like a chamber music thing. Some people wouldn't even play on this event. They would just write music or they would put together something and, and just get other people doing something cool. For mine, I did this like, um, this very experimental electronic music kind of thing. Um, with a lot, like a lot of drones and it was like very, um, like experimenting with sounds that were edited and stretched out over very, very long durations of time. Cause that, that's just some other thing that I'm into that maybe not everybody knows about. And definitely people at, you know, at, uh, the heart school weren't hip to that. I was playing around with all that stuff. So, um, and I think when you look at all the different ways people are, putting themselves out there or just like, just go on YouTube. There's like a, some kind of niche channel for like everything you could think of. Yeah. It's amazing. Clarity. (laughs) Yeah. Everything. Right. Like, and you kind of fall into this category, right? Like, I I don't, I like, I don't think that when you went to to school, like to play the clarinet, like you were thinking like, Oh yeah, I'm going to do this podcast thing when I get out. I mean, maybe you were. No, no, it's true. I wasn't. Yeah, I (laughs) know. Yeah. But that's, that's what I mean is it's like, you, like you, um, or I went on contrabass conversations. Oh, J- Jason, J- Jason Heath. Yeah. Jason Heath is like kind of the, the, the double bass version of what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Uh, but like, th- that's another one. Like he has an aptitude or you both have, um, aptitudes for this kind of stuff and, and the skill set that, that you need to run a cool podcast and like grow an audience for yourself and work with sponsors and all that stuff. Um, and I, at least from talking to Jason, I don't know about you, but it seems like it's something that he gets a lot of fulfillment out of and it that fits into his, his musical life. So I, I'm all for people just being open-minded about what a music career can even be. It's, it's, there's so many shapes to the thing and it doesn't have to be these couple buckets that you, you need to fit in or else, you know, that's it. But, um, yeah, that, I, that's the thing actually, you know, I, I feel I've heard so much lately about freelancing. Um, like, you know, Seth Haynes, obviously, Mm-hmm. Too, right. Yeah. He's big into freelancing. And so many people I know are freelancers, partly because I'm a freelancer. But in yeah. some ways, I feel like freelancing can feel if you're not careful, it can feel almost like you haven't yet succeeded instead of that you're someplace that's worth being. How do you sort of get your mind around that? Yeah, well, it's like I, um, actually I had a couple conversations about this recently, but <laughs> um, yeah, one that I was talk. there's like a, a bright side to it and a dark side. Right. So the dark side, um, which is one conversation I have is like, you, you're kind of like a musical plumber, right? You're just this <laughs> sort of hired person that shows up and they just need you to do the job and then you do it and then they pay you and then you leave and then it's done. Right. That's it. Like you, you, you came and unclogged the sink, right? The musical, however, whatever you want to extend the analogy to. That's going um, on my next business card for sure. <laughs> right. Sean Perrin, musical plumber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's like that, that's and a lot of people they they don't really do so well with that, you know. And it's it, they it's what you're talking about. They feel like their career was supposed to be more than that somehow, and they just end up feeling like like they're kind of on this tour to nowhere, where they're just they go from like gig to gig, and maybe one's good or one's bad, and then and that's it. It's not it's just not what they imagined it to be. Um, but the bright side is I've talked to a, a couple people and have a, a couple, I would say, you know, pretty good friends, kind of acquaintances, friends, you know, people I know. Um, but they really like doing that. Uh, one guy that I'm thinking of is a bass player and he does a lot of like 
he plays weddings, he does cover band stuff, you know, he does restaurant gigs, he does private parties, he teaches lessons. And the way he thinks about it is he's like, man, I get to make sound for a living. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. And that really works for him. Um, another guy, I know he's a, a keyboard player and he, he has a similar kind of thing. He just does these gigs for society. You know, he plays a lot of private events, a lot of weddings. Um, he does more recording work cause he has some gear at his house and things, but, but he's another one. He's like, man, I, like you can totally just be a working musician and, and like for him, the joy of just like making a cool phrase or like playing grooves for a living, like that's enough for him. And he's really excited by that. Um, I feel like that's maybe a little bit more common with like jazz people or people who are into like rock or pop music. Um, because there is no orchestra job where, yeah. whereas like some people, they imagine themselves in, in the, or the orchestral position or as like the soloist, and then they get going freelancing out, out of necessity. And then the big orchestra career never happens. And they, they feel like freelancing is some kind of compromise. Mm -hmm. But like, I think if, if you really make a good go at it, freelancing can be a real career because as I see these people, like I said, the more pop and rock and jazz minded people, a lot of them, they treat it as a real career and, and they're happy with it. So I think a lot of it comes down to just how how you view it and your mindset. And, you know, like if, if you you need to embrace it, basically, mm -hmm. um, like if that looks like it's what you're going to do. I'm not saying like don't take orchestra auditions if that's what you want to do. But yeah, if you're playing with like regional groups and subbing around and, and teaching some lessons like like lean into it, man, like be the best at that you can possibly be and, and see how good you can make it. Um, yeah. and like, like, sorry to interrupt, but no, like, it's fine. It's so hard on Skype sometimes. It's so annoying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to you, but to use Jason Heath as an example, like with him and from what he's told me, he said that, you know, he just sort of started writing and doing the blog thing in like 2006 or 2007 when it was like a new concept to a lot of people. Nobody knew what a blogger was yet. He just started doing it and writing down all these crazy stories and all the things that are on his website. And it was like a very, or he just like started doing it to do it because he enjoyed some component of the process. And then, you know, he eventually he just leaned into it and now it's, it's what it is. He has this big bass podcast and he's interviewed everybody and it's, it's, it's turned into a thing of its own. So, um, yeah, I think, I wouldn't sell yourself short too quick or, 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 or try to put yourself in a box too quickly as like, Oh, I'm a freelancer because I can't get an orchestra job. It's like, well, why don't you make freelancing awesome somehow? There's gotta be a way. Yeah. There has to be a way. Like I, I really do not accept when people say like, no, I'm going to be miserable. Like don't be mopey, man. Come on. Like, like find a way to make it cool. You can do it. Well, two things come to mind there, and let's focus on um, this for a second because, well, first of all, I, I just want to point out for those listening, especially those who do play in orchestras, <laughs> there's a, um, his book actually, it's not really so much about freelancing in the sense that it's the only path. It's about finding yeah. the path that you want. And if that means setting yourself up to be in the perfect position to take the best audition you can, I think that that fits in here as well. But it really, you know, one thing that is true about it is it really is for new music grads. I don't think that this, this isn't necessarily intended towards someone who's already been playing in an orchestra for 20 years or something like that. I mean, there's actionable yeah. steps in here as well, but, but it's, it's a very niche targeted book, which I think is great. Um, but one thing that you just sort of um, hit the nail right on the head of exactly what I wanted to just talk about, actually, you mentioned in here, allowing yourself to feel bad in the short term because it's an excellent motivator in the, uh, towards long-term goals. And so basically what you just said about feeling sort of down about something is that actually a good thing? And are we sort of wrong as a society to always push away our negative thoughts? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm all for being positive. I, it's not good to be chronically down and chronically negative. Cause that's, that gets you into all kinds of self-defeating kinds of things. Um, and it'll, it'll prevent you from, from going where you have the potential to go. So chronically negative is bad, but I think feeling, um, acutely negative or acutely dissatisfied with the outcome of something, um, in the short term, that's a healthy thing that you need to experience. It's like, cause sometimes like when you go for something and it doesn't work, 
it's it's just good to feel the burn a little bit because then that's what's going to it's going to motivate you to to work on it and to improve or to reevaluate what you're doing like i just to use myself as an as, as an example i just had one of those with the kickstarter mm-hmm. um uh, I, we were talking about it a little bit before we started rolling, right? I had this, I have this end pin that I invented. That's like the next entrepreneurial project that I did after the book. I invented this end pin. I'm trying to raise money to get the thing produced because I, I have prototypes. They work great. I'm really happy with it. And it's something that I like using, but I'm trying to get it manufactured. That takes a bunch of money. Uh, I tried to raise it on Kickstarter. I came up with like half of it and then it stalled. I wasn't able to to get any more funding in. So I was like, Oh no, here we go. You know, well, and Kickstarter uh, for those who don't know is all or nothing. Um, and it's hard because you have to set the goal at a place where if you succeed, you have to be able to fulfill the, the orders. Yeah. So you can't just set it low and be like, Oh, well, if I only get half, I'll just do it. it, it it's, there's an amount that you set that you need to actually complete the project if you don't get there. So anyways, carry on about how, how this. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So like I had to feel that like I, for that project, to, to get off the ground, I had to raise about $16,000 and I raised $8,000, but because it's Kickstarter, I got nothing. So I had, (laughs) I had to be like, okay, great. I just raised 8,000 bucks, paid for advertising, spent a month of my life, like emailing all these people and, and, and just trying to drum up some noise. And at the end of the month I had a a goose egg, right? So that felt terrible. And I, I think it was good that it felt terrible because then I had to sit down and say like, okay, you know, this didn't, this didn't pan out. What are the, what are the options, right? What, what, what can I possibly do to fix this, if anything? Uh, and then I, I came up with some things and, you know, I just tried to not think about it for a couple of days and get my head out of it, um, to stay fresh and, and just get some perspective on it. Cause you can't have any perspective when you're, when you're like down in the middle of things like that, when you're down in the weeds. So, yeah. um, yeah, like I think, and it's, and you don't want to like deny yourself. You don't want to deny feelings. Like if you feel bad about something, it's okay to be like, yeah, this sucks. I'm not happy or I'm angry or I'm disappointed or like, but you also need to, well, let me back up. I think acknowledging that is an important step in moving past that and making forward progress with whatever it is you're trying to do if you don't acknowledge that there's a problem and that it made you feel bad, then it's, it's hard to move on because then you, you sort of carry that baggage with you into the the next steps. And you don't want to have a weight like that weighing down on everything it is that you're doing. Well, it helps you move in the right direction too, right? I mean, one thing I think of is that the body and mind in a way, we have this sort of reaction to pain. So if you set your hand on a hot stove and it doesn't burn you. There's a problem, of course, right? But the burning <laughs> lets you know that you should lift your hand back, right? So no yeah. one in their right mind would go, well, it hurts, but I'm just going to leave it here a little longer. <laughs> right, right. You, know, you pull your hand away. It kind of helps you not to do that next time as well. And maybe you put your hand somewhere else. <laughs> but, yeah, and um, with, with the Kickstarter, I definitely got a little bit of that kind of burn. I said, you know what? Okay. Once I, I had a minute to take a step back, I, I can see some of the things that um, that I could have done better and things that I could improve on for the future. And, you know, like it's, but I'm a, I'm a believer that it's better to just go and put yourself out there and do it because even if you do get burned, you'll learn a lot that'll carry over into the future and it's all cumulative. The next project I'll, I'll have that knowledge and that experience. And then I can say, uh, that last time, you know, this, this didn't work out. So we're going to do it differently this time. Is your end pin able to be used on other instruments? I, I actually see some value in it for as a bass clarinet um, floor peg because of the yeah. angling that it can do. That is something worth exploring. I, I, I had a lot of requests for like cello versions. Mm-hmm. Um, bass clarinet is actually something I didn't think of. That's it interesting. It always slips back, right? It's, it's angled and the, it, it slips towards you if the floor is not... Um, uh, I got to get so. a... I, I, I got to talk to a bass clarinet player. I have a good friend in New York who I might, uh, I'll license it to you. I'll license it. To you. <laughs> <laughs> I just invented it. <laughs> oh man. But so yeah, I think there might be something there, but, um, anyway, so you said there was some news surrounding this though. What's, what's happened with it since the Kickstarter? Oh, okay. So, um, let's see. I, I have to keep a little bit, a, li- a little bit of a lid on certain things, but, um, Basically what happened was I, I put the Kickstarter out there 
And one of the things that I said to myself before I even started with it is I said, you know what, we're going to do this. And if it works, great. If it does not work, at the least I got this end pin that I just wanted anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So I got something that I, I really wanted. And the Kickstarter will help me get my reach into some new places and, and meet some new people that I, I probably wouldn't contact otherwise. I'd, I'd probably never run into them. Um, so it, I, I looked at it as at the least, even if it was a complete failure, it's just another way to help get my name out there and show people what I'm doing um, and attract them to some of my other projects like the book or my bass playing or um, anything that I might do down the road. So I thought it was a good thing to do for those reasons alone. Um, and what ended up happening with it was I had a couple people get in touch with me independently after the campaign was finished. Um, and I'm working with a couple people to, to help get the thing financed, mm. um, outside of Kickstarter. So it's, it's easier because I'll be working with less people. Um, and I, there's one person in particular who has a lot of manufacturing expertise because he's done products before he's brought things to market. He got in touch with me and, and we've been talking about just things that I, I could improve upon and things um, to, to get past some of the challenges specific to the, the end pin project. Um, just as far as like manufacturing costs and getting around minimum order quantities and mm -hmm. things like that, as, as well as some, some ways to market it a little bit better. So, um, and th this is all happening like within the last two weeks. Um, but again, like had I never done this Kickstarter that didn't work, quote unquote, didn't work. I would have never met any of these people who, who think it's a great idea and want to help me to make it work. So, well, look uh, at the demand that you did demonstrate. I mean, you may not have reached the goal, but clearly a certain number of people were interested enough in, in it, you know? Well, that's, yeah, that's the other thing is now I can approach people and say, if I'm going to ask for money to get, um, to get something funded, I can say, Hey, well, I know for a fact that this many people are interested and I could show them that, okay, this many people made it to the page and then this many actually contributed something. So we, I have a good case now that like, Hey, this is something people are interested in and willing to pay for. Yeah. So, um, in that respect, it, it passed the test, even though we didn't hit our funding goal. So, um, yeah, but like, going back to what we were talking about before, like, like at the end of the month when it didn't work, it's still like, ugh. Man, like yeah, the agony yeah. of defeat, you know? <laughs> so, um, but it's good to be proactive and change and sort of move forward and, and, uh, hold yourself accountable, but not too accountable and try something else, you know, be open to new things. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, that, that's another thing that I think is important is, um, it's really, when something doesn't work out, it's very easy to rationalize it and say that, oh, well it was the, it was some external factor which caused this thing to not work. Um, and I put this in the book for a reason. I'm a big believer in personal accountability. Mm -hmm. um, I, when something like that happens, it's all my fault. It's, it's no, other, I can't say that, oh, this didn't work or not enough people looked at their email that day or whatever. It's like, I, I'm just going to roll with it on the basis that I probably could have done this better and found a way to make it work. So mm -hmm. it's, it's my fault. It didn't work. I got to take full responsibility for it. And I think when I do that, that's the most potent way to, to improve myself and, and my skills when it comes to, to marketing something or it, same extends to, um, to bass playing. Like I put the West side story anecdote in there about how I just, I was really young and, and green and totally, just, I just blew it on a gig. And because of the nature of that gig, there was no way I could talk myself out of it, that it, it somehow wasn't my fault or oh, I was just having a bad day. It was like, no, dude, you you just face planted over and over again. Nobody else can take credit for that. It's all this guy right here. So, um, and that's something else I like that, about your, your book actually though, is that you, you don't just focus on the idea. Some of the books, I guess they kind of make it seem like if you can make the connection, then you've got the gig in the bag and you're good to go. But you put a lot of emphasis on the fact that you need to keep your performance up. You need to oh, yeah. play, you need to play and sound like the person you're advertising. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds like a, uh, an obvious thing to some people, but it's funny. Like you're, if you're going to think of like your playing and, and your, um, 
your service is like the product that you're advertising, right? Like, like part of the product, if you're a freelance musician is like, you show up on time, you're nice to work with and not a pain, right? You, you're like wearing the right suit and you sound good. Like, but no, no networking trick or marketing trick or, or technique is going to get you out of that one. If, if you go and, and don't sound good and don't keep your chops in shape. Yeah. Uh, this, so that's like the, the assumption of the book is that you're committed to that already, that you're like that, that we, we don't even have to talk about it. You practice, you know, you work hard, you care about sounding good. You don't want to go and dog it on anyone else's gig. Like, that's that's assumed in the book. You have to have that together mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, if you don't, nothing in my book is going to help you. And you would be better cert- like like thinking back to when I was like 19 and like I just couldn't do anything. I started playing relatively late. Um, no idea how I even got into music school, to be completely honest. I just mm-hmm. I think that they saw that I was willing to work hard and that's it. But when I was 18 or 19 and I like I couldn't play in tune, I couldn't even I couldn't play with a bow at all. I didn't know how that worked. Um, this book at that point in my life wouldn't have helped me any because yeah. I shouldn't be reading a book about like networking and finding gigs. I should be reading like etude books and working on excerpts yeah. and scales and, you know, doing bow technique and all those things. So that's really what I focused on, um, for, for, you know, at least what it's like seven or eight years, you know, that's all I was really thinking about. Um, and I was, I was maybe in error back then. Like if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have started learning some of the other skills a little earlier. Um, cause I, I was operating under the assumption that a lot of music students work under where they say, Oh, if I just get my playing to be really good and take care of that and, and sound awesome, then all the other stuff will fall into place. Yeah. Which is a huge I, myth. A huge myth. Right. But I thought that for a long time, a lot of people think that, Um, yeah, I mean, and just thinking back, like my level of playing that I'm at right now is already past what I thought I was ever going to get to when I was like 18 or 19 and first starting school. I didn't think I would be able to do some of the things I can do now. Um, and I'm not like on top of Mount Olympus, you know, I'm just like a working freelancer. I'm not like raking it in. I make a living, but I'm not like loaded yet, you know? So <laughs> like I say, yes. <laughs> I, I'm an optimist, man. You yeah, know, I got things yeah. coming, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully down the road, I want to, I want to do better as far as the financial stuff. And that's why I'm doing some of these, these business ideas. And I still practice every day when, as much as I can, like mm-hmm. I still, I'm still trying to be, um, I'm still trying to keep up the level of hunger I had when I was like, I first got into, to school and decided I was going to go as hard as I could at all this stuff. I, I just want to keep that going as long as, as possible. And hopefully in the long run it pays off. But, um, but also another, one of the reasons I did the book is, you know, if, if you want to do that and, and at least I think this way, if, if I want to do really well down the line and, and have the, have the resources to work on some of these more ambitious projects that take a bigger investment of time and money and, also will will pay back more in the long run. You need you need a base to stand on. You need some work. You need to not be super concerned all the time about how the bills are getting paid and all that. So um yeah, like for a, I had I had to struggle in the beginning, you know, because I didn't have any work and I at, at the end of school I was sounding okay. I was, you know, a lot better than I was when I was 18. Um so that's where I started to really focus on the the career stuff more. Um, and, and keep the, the music thing and keep the, um, like keep all the scales and the practice and keep that happening. But then also bring in some of these new skills that, um, I was a little behind on, on learning. Like the business skills you mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, what I mean. Like yeah. business skills, you know, how to, like I said, how to get in touch with people for gigs and how to, how to get other people to call you for gigs and, and just, just like set myself up on a, on a solid base where I'm working, I'm still improving you know, but the lights are on. I'm not worried about where my next meal is coming from, you know, and also that I'm not in some, I don't get sucked into some other job that like completely takes me away from music. Um, one of the, yeah, one of the things I put in the book, you know, like if, if getting a day job or or something maybe not completely related to what you want to do, if, if that makes sense to do, or you find a right, the right opportunity, 
I'm not saying don't do that. You, you absolutely should. But um, if you want to do music, it's easy to get siphoned away by some other other career. So you have to be a little careful with the day job or. Yeah, let's yeah. let's dig into the day job thing for a second, sure. because I, I think that it's a little bit unrealistic for someone to graduate from from music school and right away, you know, call up your parents and say, hey, you know, I'd love to get some work, but I'm actually just going to be a freelancer right now. Go, you know, <laughs> it's a little tough. I mean, even, you know, anyone, I don't, don't want to say even me, I'm not really any different than anyone else, but I had to work my fair share of jobs throughout university and high school and uh, totally. after graduating. And one of the things I really love that you said, two things actually, was that you should find something that either boosts your musical skills or kind of boosts an area that you're lacking in. Or yeah. if you're at a job that, let's say you're just working at a coffee shop, there still must be something there that you can learn and apply towards your music skills, whether it's how the place is managed, what the pricing structure looks like, how you're dealing yeah. with customers, all these things, they, they all have value, right? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, so talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, so like, as far as like the day job stuff, like some people get out of school, like I get it, if, if you're really strapped for money and you just like need any gig right now or any job, like, do what you got to do. Sometimes that's just life. You know, this stuff isn't, um, I'm, I'm not selling anyone a guarantee of like a perfectly smooth problem free transition. Like it's, <laughs> it's going to be some bumps, right? Like, yeah. um, that's just, that's just how it is. But as far as jobs, once, once you're like meeting your basic needs and maybe you're in a position where, you know, like I said, you're getting by, but things aren't what you want them to be. Start looking for things that, at least inch you a little bit closer towards that. So like, for example, like some people, if you go and get like the coffee shop job, right, you're slinging lattes. Yeah. Um, just, just cause it's easy to get and exists in most, most cities where people live. Right. Um, that could be a huge waste of time for a lot of people because that doesn't have a ton to do with making music, right. You're just pouring drinks for people, but yeah, I could see if you're after certain skills or you have a certain level of contact with your boss or like you could some, you could maybe get something out of that. Like I think in the book, one of the examples I, I talk about is like, say you decide you want to work on your, your interpersonal skills and talking to people. Maybe you're, you're shy, right? And you have trouble with that aspect of the networking thing. Then a gig at a coffee shop could be really good for you yes. because because you're talking to people all day long, right? Um, or same, like I've seen people get the same kind of value out of like bartending or like even sales jobs and stuff like that, where they, they have to just work one-on-one -on -one with people and they have to talk and they have to get comfortable with that. That's an area where you could, you could maybe benefit if, if you think that that's what you need. In my case, um, the, the job I had that I got a lot out of was in my undergraduate years, I got this this gig working for a guy who ran a wedding band and a sound company. Oh, wow. And I was basically, I was a roadie on the tour to nowhere, right? <laughs> so the, <laughs> the, 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 the the truck would roll up with, with all the gear and I was the guy who had to unload all the cases and, you know, set up the, the speakers and coil cables and lights and, and all that stuff. Um, but I got a lot out of that job because I got to be around a working band and I got to hang out around all these working musicians who th they just, they work mostly locally. They travel a little bit. Um, but I got to just pick their brains and, and see what they think about things and how they do things. And then I also got to have a lot of contact with the business owner. So I got to see how he would run things. I got to see him negotiate with customers. Mm -hmm. I got to see how they would price things and how, how he would sell the band, the kinds of, when he was trying to expand his business, I could see the kinds of things he was pushing into. And I got to, you know, at a certain point I was actually working in the office with him as an assistant basically. And I was doing some video editing and, um, sound editing for some of the, the projects that went out to clients and things. So that was, that was a gig where, or a job where I, I got a lot out of it because I saw how like a, a real live working music business did things. Yeah. Um, and I got to, I got to just like sit and watch and, and get something out of that. So, um, yeah, a job, like if you can find something where you're learning, that's the best value you, you're, you're going to get out of it, you know? 
Because the nature of any job is somebody figures out, hey, I could make a whole lot of money if I get somebody to do a little bit of this work and help me with it. And I just I just give them a little bit of that that big chunk. Right. Yeah. Um, so, y- you know, y- it's better when you think about it that way. It's way better to be in the position of being the guy who's hiring people and, and getting that big chunk of money for yourself um, and, and be hiring people. But to get to that place you usually have to work for somebody else to see how things are done. That's just how it works. Well, and to go back to the coffee shop thing for a second, I mean, sure. I'm, not, I'm not advocating, I'm not advocating that every musician runs and gets a job in a coffee shop, but <laughs> yeah. you know, one thing you can also observe with something like that and to, to be a little more positive about is yes, it's helping you pay the bills, but it's also potentially if you get the right shifts, it's opening up your, all your evenings, you know? Oh, you that could too. Be, you yeah. Know, you could work at a coffee shop from six to three and then teach from, from five to nine or take a gig or do whatever in the evening, practice all night, whatever you feel like. And as long as you're smart about it, you can sort of keep going. Um, that's, that's well, flexibility is another facet to the job thing that I think you need to consider in addition to what it is you're doing. Like yeah. the reason that like going back to this, um, this sound job for the, the wedding band company that I was talking about, one of the reasons that that worked out was, I like they had a lot of people that they would call for these gigs so I could pick when I worked. Right. And it was most of the time on weekends. So I could make that work around a school schedule because I was in Mm -hmm. classes and stuff most of the days. Or if I had to go and do a a concert or something, I could I could get somebody to fill in for me and and make it then make both work and balance the the two things at one time. So I, I totally agree. Flexibility is a big thing. If if it's easy to to shift things around, like that's totally worth something. Well, along the lines of your personal accountability, I mean, all this is to find a way to pay the bills, right? I mean, it's yeah. not a long-term solution either. If, if you find yourself five years from now still at that coffee shop, maybe you should sort of reconsider, <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it reminds me of my experience. I don't want to go into it too much, but when I had first graduated university, I was yeah. working at a computer store, a Mac computer store, um, not an Apple store, like an official one, but just like a, sort of an offshoot of that anyways. Sure. Um, and I found that I, I did learn a ton of great skills as far as like salesmanship and, um, how pricing structure works in a store, how to sell to people, all these different things, right? It really valuable stuff. Um, but there was also a point when I realized, or maybe I realized it sort of <laughs> by what happened, but I got offered a promotion and I'd been there for a while and I, but I didn't want to accept it because I developed on the side a whole bunch of teaching gigs and playing stuff. And, uh, and so okay. I actually, I turned it down. I said, no, I'd, I'd like to continue doing what I'm doing so that I can keep doing what I actually want to do on the side. And sure. then I got fired. <laughs> so, because, you know, it was, it almost seemed like I wasn't willing to put in the time and I, I looked at it and I was like, actually I'm not. <laughs> so, so when do you know, like I was very lucky actually by getting fired. I know that sounds strange, but it sort of yeah. kicked me into high gear and that was about, Oh, seven years ago now, I'd say. And I've been doing freelance pretty much ever since. Um, mm-hmm. And and uh, I think that if, if I hadn't had that push, though, it might have been a few more years. So how do you identify or what would you suggest as to how people can identify when it's time to pull the plug on something like that and move on? When are they just clinging on because it's comfortable to a job like that? Oh, yeah, I think I, I think there's a, there's going to be some kind of transition period always where where it's going to be a little dicey and you're like, uh, I don't know. I mean, in your case, I can see why it, it looked like the time to do it because you had enough other things going on that if you there left the day job, <laughs> what's that? There wasn't much choice either. They weren't too pleased. Yeah. But it's, but when you have some teaching happening and some other, some other work going on yeah, and you get, you get fired or you get laid off from the day job, it's not the end of the world. Cause then you're like, okay, well, let me just see if I can take this other stuff I have going on and just make it bigger and make that what I do. Um, in my case, like what happened to me, I've, I've been freelancing in one form or another for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I, I had, I had a couple jobs like the, the wedding band job was one of them, but also a lot in college. Um, before that happened, I had a lot of problems finding, work that paid enough, you know, cause I'm, I'm on this huge state school campus where there's thousands and thousands of kids and everybody wants a part-time job. So a lot of what I could find was just like, you know, fast food stuff that paid very, very little. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So what I ended up doing is I would just go on Craigslist and do odd jobs for people. I would move boxes or like, like if somebody was moving, I would help them unload their U-Haul, you know, and, and yeah. get their, their new house set up. I like, I pulled weeds for people. I, you know, I, I shoveled mulch in people's yards, like all that. I raked leaves. I like, I would do anything. Um, and then later on, like after graduate school, what I ended up doing was I got into, um, freelancing as a camera operator. I had some people kind of through this, this gig that I talked about, I had some friends who were in that world, um, as like freelance video and audio people. Um, so I, I took the plunge there. I bought a camera. Um, I started shooting a little bit in graduate school, just doing like recitals and things for friends. I was doing DVDs for grandmas who couldn't come to the recital, that kind of thing. Um, and then when I graduated, I, I actually tried to do what you were saying and like, like get a day job just to like have a base to stand on and, and then like do, do my freelancing and, and do my teaching and then grow it slowly and like have that smooth problem free transition that, that I don't think exists. Um, and yeah, I just, I couldn't find a job. I had a lot of problems finding anything that was decent or, you know, I would, I would get to the interview and then you know, it would come down to me and the other guy and the other guy would get it or so, um, I was having trouble finding a steady, a steady job. And then I ended up just getting more into this camera stuff. And then for maybe about a year or two, it was kind of 50, 50. I would like film some stuff and then I would, I was teaching and then I was playing and the two were kind of, uh, in a balance. It was about 50, 50 for a while. Um, and then slowly it, transitioned over to mostly just bass playing, which is, um, less lucrative than being a freelance camera operator. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's what I really want to be doing. I want to be doing music. I want to be playing bass and I want to be teaching and doing projects like this book and the end pen. And that's, that's what really gets me excited. Um, the, the camera stuff, like I said, it's, it's a cool career for certain people, but I felt like it was kind of just, you know, um, you know, it, it was just a job. I didn't have that much of an attachment to it. Um, well, and there's the same thing, identifying a little bit of dissatisfaction and, and making sure you move in the, the right direction. Um, that, that connection at the camera job, just maybe think of another thing in here that I really liked in the sure. book that I, I don't know how you clarified some of these thoughts that I've always kind of had floating around, but never really realized. <laughs> um, <laughs> but one of them you say, which was so insightful is you should really be respectful and, and, um, polite and treat everybody in a way that's, that's, that's um, conducive to good business, I guess. And, and that's not the way you worded it, but, but basically the reason is because you never know not only who you're going to meet, but you never know who people might become. And I thought that was a really, oh. that was a deep yeah. moment for me. I was like, Oh wow. Um, and, and a personal example of this, by the way, was I worked this really, uh, a clinic situation. I was teaching at a school. I'm not going to dare say which one, but, um, sure. <laughs> It was a really bad situation. They would take up to six months to pay us. We'd show up. The kids wouldn't be there. Um, you'd show, yeah, I'd show up. To, yeah. You know, it, it's it's like, what? The drag. You, you set your Monday night aside and there was nobody there. But one of the guys I met working there, um, he actually became the person who not only convinced me to apply for my first grant, but he sort of mentored me through the process and became the producer on my album. And what? If it, yeah. And if it wasn't for just go, showing up to this, you know, stupid gig every Monday night, <laughs> I wouldn't have uh, yeah, had that yeah. encounter. I, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have led to that. I might still have never done that step in my life. And it was just a situation like where you talk about in the book with networking, we'd actually, what happened is one of the nights the kids hadn't show up, showed up. We went to the bar across the street cause we figured, well, we drove all the way here. Let's have a pint together. <laughs> yeah. That was all the yeah, teachers. Yeah. And that's when this discussion came up and, uh, but if it hadn't been for all that, or if I just kind of stomped off and went home and been upset about it, um, none of that would have happened. But so w w what was your sort of uh, realization about that that compelled you to write that in this way? Oh, man. Um, well, I've, I've just seen it happen enough times where somebody, somebody who I met either in school or on a gig somewhere who was just like, like not happening, like it, w it just wasn't good. But then, you know, at the time I might have, like, especially when I was, you know, in my late teens, early twenties, those years, I might've been really dismissive up front, but now, now I'm, I'm 29, I'm going to be 30 this year. And I've had, that's enough time where I've seen some people come and go, um, yeah. over the last 10 years. And there have been a couple of people that really surprised me where I said like, you know, five or six years down the road, 
somebody really works hard and they get really good. And like, I've, I've even seen people like win big or- orchestra jobs and like win competitions. And, yeah. and I'm like, that guy got it. What? I remember when, and, um, that's why I, I just think the best policy is to just be cool and to just, you know, treat everybody with the same standard of decency. Uh, even if, even if you don't think their playing is so great, you know, like, I mean, if, if they're a jerk, then fine. Right. Then they're, they're, they're disqualifying themselves. But, yeah. um, yeah, like sometimes, I mean, I actually, I've even seen some people who like start out as jerks and then they figure out that that's not a good way to be. And then they, they come to their senses and start and they, they just learn how to be cooler. So, um, yeah, I think like as far as the networking stuff, you just never know what somebody is going to turn into, especially if you're talking to younger people who are still developing very quickly. Um, and then on the, the other side of that, when you're in a group of people and you don't know everybody, you, you got to, you know, feel things out kind of delicately because some, like you really don't know who you're talking to a lot of the time or who they might know or, you know, what they might be able to, to open up for you or how you might be able to help them somehow and make a, a new relationship where you, you both benefit. Um, so yeah. And I've just, I've seen that, I've seen people blow it on that so many times where they shoot their mouth off or, or, or offend somebody. And then, you know, an opportunity walks out the door and it's like, Oh no, you just, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. I've um, seen it too. Yeah. And then, and then like in my own personal development, I remember being that guy in school who was like the worst dude and everybody treated me like I wasn't supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. Right. And then now I'm, I'm, I'm different. I have a lot, a lot of things together that I didn't have together back then. Um, and it took a lot of work and a lot of sweat and a lot of, a lot of sacrifice, but, um, yeah, I think I remember the people who were cool to me back in the day and who wasn't, Yeah, you know, yeah. I th- that like, that really makes you think I'm like, okay, this guy, you know, he, he treated me with respect when, you know, I, I he just saw that I was like trying to swim and, and not really doing such a good job at it. I can't remember the quote, <laughs> like, but there's some quote that says, uh, people will always forget what you say, but never how you made them feel or something like that. Yeah. Like sometimes, like I said, if, if you, if you make somebody feel like they don't belong or you say something that, um, uh, that's like a, like a passive aggressive kind of thing or something that makes them feel bad, like they're not going to be on your side if you need them down the road. Yeah. Um, and, and like, it's, it's, it's funny too. Cause I've, I've, I've even, I have a couple people at a network who are like, they're like kind of, um, I don't want, they're like cranky is maybe the word for it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've seen, you know, they're just like, they're just like, (laughs) yeah, they're just like a little cranky in terms of how they say things and they might come off as cynical. But when I look at what they actually do, like their actions, I'm like, Oh no, this is, this is a good person. This is somebody who's helped me out who I would be happy to help out. Um, they're just like a little, a little cantankerous, you know, like, um, but th- that doesn't make them, them bad people. Yeah, absolutely. So may, I mean, maybe they could, they could work on that, but a lot of them don't care, you know, and they, they, they make their living and that's it. So whatever, th- they're allowed to be who they want to be. But, um, I, I think from my perspective, the best policy is to just, just be cool with everybody. So I'm going to have to limit myself to one more thing to talk to you about here. Um, sure. Because I just realized we're coming up on our allotted time that you're available and that I'm available. And also, okay. you know, just for listeners to be aware, um, we, we've skipped around a little bit, but I'm on about page 27 out of 120 of the things I wanted okay. to talk about. <laughs> so oh, there's wow. <laughs> so much density in here, just great points, one, one after another, all the way through the book. I mean, I, I was just really surprised by the what I took away from this, this, this book. And I feel like I could talk to Emilio all afternoon about this stuff. Um, but one thing I want to touch on quickly before we stop is, is this element of failure that you talk about and the importance to recognize that within music failure actually is not that big of a deal. Like if your album, I'm just going to really read from the page here. If your album release flops or nobody comes to your show, so what a building didn't collapse, no war was started, nobody died. You're not getting shot at things will, you know, things will work themselves out kind of, right? And you can go back and reframe it and try again, also without the risk of some sort of catastrophic failure, you know? Right, 
Right. I think um, <laughs> there's there's definitely certain professions where like if you screw up, it's like much bigger problems than like if, if no one came to your concert. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like my, my personal experience with that is like, like my dad's a civil engineer and then I have a lot of military people in my family. Right. Yeah. Those, those kinds of jobs, like if you make a mistake, like the consequences are much more dire. Um, in music, like you, can you lose money? Yeah. Can you lose time? Yeah. Can you look like a dummy? Yeah. But you can recover from all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think, it's whenever something doesn't work out the way you wanted, that just means you have to learn more. Like a sign of um, a sign of mastery at a skill is when things work out the way that you imagine they're going to work out, mm-hmm. because you can you can see like the the cascade of events that leads to the outcome, right? So if if that doesn't happen, it just means you have to you, you have to figure something out or you have to learn more. Um, so I think when when you have a failure. It's it's important to like I said you're allowed to feel bad it's allowed to to be upset by it but once you get past that that initial um, that initial jolt you need to go back and be like okay what happened here let's go through it let's let's analyze this a little bit and then take from it what you can and then when you do the next one try to incorporate what you've learned from that um, and then also I think it's important to not plan for failure, but just like always ask yourself when you're going into something like, what's the worst case scenario here? If this doesn't, if this doesn't work out, like with the Kickstarter, Mm -hmm. right. As I'm saying, okay, the worst case scenario is that I get this end pin thing that I wanted and I'm get in touch with a bunch of new people and I get no money. That's, that's, and, and maybe some people think I'm stupid. Right. That's like, (laughs) so like, so like I said, okay, if that's like the nightmare of this thing, that's the absolute worst case outcome, then that's pretty good. Actually, that that, then it's a no brainer. Like we're going to do it. Right. I don't care if a couple people think I'm stupid and I get a couple things that I wanted anyway. So cool. Um, but I think that's, that's an important question to, to always ask. Like if you're going to do an album, you have to say to yourself like, well, what happens if no, if I make this thing and put in all the time and money and nobody cares what happened? Like, are you still going to be happy with the fact that you did this album? Mm-hmm. Maybe yes, maybe no. That's a personal question. But, um, I think in, in any project it's, you need to look at both sides of it. Like, and, and musicians sometimes get very focused on, um, like if it works and all this good stuff happens, but they don't always look at the, the other side of it. And it's like, what, what if it doesn't work out? Um, and I think if you, it, it's not a way to, it, I have to tread kind of lightly cause I don't want to s- people to go into things and like expect them to not work. Cause mm. sometimes things do work and it's awesome. Right. But I think it's important to have a balanced viewpoint going into things like that. So either way that what it, it's going to do, what it, it does and either way you're sort of prepared for it. Yeah, and it's does worth, that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and it's worth noting too that um, y- on your way to those successes, you're going to encounter more failures probably than you think, and the yeah. fact that you're failing more actually means you're getting closer to some sort of success. If that makes any sense. Because yeah, you're... I think um, I, like the, some people like throw around these things. They're like, "Oh, fail forward," and it, like I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't completely buy all that. Like it's like sometimes you can like. Um, but so, like, I don't know, sometimes you fail and it just means you screwed up, you know, and it, like there's no, there's no, uh, sugar coated way to, to talk about it. Um, so yeah, sometimes you just screwed something up and you have to admit it to yourself. Like I said, the personal accountability thing, like you just have to admit to yourself, like, okay, I did some stuff wrong. Maybe it was because of some kind of, uh, you know, like lack of knowledge with something or there are sometimes it, it's like a lack of discipline in some area, but you just have to be honest with yourself about like, okay, this is what happened and this is what it is. And here's what we're going to do moving forward. Um, like I've certainly had moments like that where, where I dropped the ball just because, you know, I wasn't like disciplined or I didn't prepare for something the right way. And then again, I feel the burn and then I have to just look at it and say, this didn't work because of this. And whatever that reason is, you have to you have to own it and and say, okay, well, if it's because of some 
um, some lack of my own skills or I wasn't disciplined enough or whatever. I just have to say like, okay, this is what I'm going to do to correct that. And that's how we move forward and grow from a failure instead of letting it define us and, and hold us back and be this dead weight that drags on you. So that's, that's really the biggest thing I think is to go in to like part with the failure amicably, (laughs) if that makes any sense Mm -hmm. to, because you don't want to go forward and be like, go into the next thing and have the last setback be, be still weighing on you and like, Oh, but in your mouth almost. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to have that dragging on you. You want to go into the next thing, like 110% and have, um, and and you just don't want stuff like that holding you back and feeling like, like your head, part of your head is still like in this other thing that happened in the past. You want to go into the next endeavor full on with your full focus and no distractions, ideally. Totally. So yeah, thanks for so much for sharing all that great information about your book. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still impressed with the density of information there. If you, if anyone's interested, the book's called Make It a Guide for Recent Music Graduates, um, Graduates, and um, it's available, like I said, on Amazon for only $3. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But you've also been generous to provide one signed paperback copy as a giveaway what would you say to the person who gets to win this item, Emilio? What would I say to them? Direct, oh man, directly to them. <laughs> oh man, well, um, hopefully they read it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> read the book. Read the book if you get it. Yeah. Yeah, but no. What I would say to them is, I would I would wish them all the best with whatever it is they want to do, and um, and I would extend this to actually everybody who has a copy. Is if you want to reach out to me, I'm very easy to get in touch with. Um, if you have questions about things, just send me an email. Like if, if you go on my website, there's a contact form that goes straight to my inbox. Um, I'm not like, I'm still a pretty small operation, you know, so I'm easy to get in touch with. If you just want to talk to me and tell me about what's going on about your, like your situation or where you're at, I would honestly love to hear from you. Um, you know, it's of course, if somebody wins a free signed copy, that's, that's kind of a special thing. So congratulations to them. Um, (laughs) But yeah, like, like if you get a copy, uh, and take a look, I'd love to know what you think. That's, that's really what I want to know. I've sent out a couple emails to my ebook customers and, and gotten some really interesting responses from people, um, just as far as what their musical lives are like and what kind of music making they do. So I'm all ears, please reach out to me. That's what I would say. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today, Emilio, and I wish you the best with all your efforts and when uh, if, we, if more happens with this end pin, please keep me updated about it. I'm interested in that. Oh, too. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, it was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. This was great. Thanks for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. For free content updates, coupons, and a chance to win giveaways mentioned on the show, please be sure to enter your email address at clarinet.com slash subscribe. The podcast is brought to you in part by the generous support of its listeners. If you'd like to learn how you can help out, please see clarinet.com slash support. Today's episode was brought to you by Dario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds.